much. Um, yes, thanks, Rosalie, and thanks very much to the Fuse Box for having me and for helping organise this talk. So, as Rosalie said, I'm a, um, I'm a PhD student from the University of Sussex. Um, I work in the Science Policy Research Unit, or SPRU. Um, so we're a department in the university that does a lot of work on innovation. So we look at firm-level innovation, um, industry and economy-level innovation. Um, we also look at innovation in relation to things like sustainability, energy demand, development, so quite, quite a broad range of topics. My research focuses on innovation in the creative industries, and that's what I'm going to be talking to you about today. So the title of the talk is Unboxing Fusion, How Combining Arts and STEM Skills can lead to better businesses. So I'm still doing my PhD. I haven't finished and I don't have that many results yet. So, spoiler alert, I'm not going to be able to fully answer this question today. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but what I am going to do is sort of outline why I'm interested in this, why I think it's important, and a sort of overview of the type of thing that I am researching and the type of answers that I hope to be able to get. So, the agenda for today, I'm going to start by explaining what the creative industries are from a sort of policy perspective, then explain a bit about the shape of the creative industries in the UK in terms of employment and GVA, then I'll introduce this idea of fusion. What is it, why is it important, and what are the challenges to creating fusion in the creative industries. And then lastly, I'm going to explain this concept of common knowledge, which I think really lies at the heart of the issue of fusion. And then hopefully we will have plenty of time for discussion. I'm aiming to be around half an hour for the talk and half an hour for discussion, so we'll see how it goes. Um, if anyone has any questions or queries or clarifications at any point, just feel free to interrupt me. So what are the creative industries? So there's many different definitions of the creative industries and the definition that I'm using for my research is the one by the DCMS, the Department for Culture, Media and Sport, because that's the definition that they use in, um, in all of their policy work. So most of the statistics that you'll hear about the creative industries are based on this definition. So they define the creative industries as those industries which have their origin in individual creativity, skill and talent, and which have a potential for wealth and job creation through the generation and exploitation of intellectual property. Now there are sort of pros and cons to this as a, um, as a definition, something which we could argue about all day, um, which I'm not going to do here. But I think the, the main point about this definition is that it's sort of a theoretical definition. And what has happened is they need to turn this theoretical definition into a practical operationalisation, a way that we can actually measure those industries. So how they've done this is they started by identifying what they call creative occupations. So those are jobs which they identify as being creative jobs. Then they use data from the annual population survey to identify how many creative workers work in each section of the economy. From that, they could see that some sectors of the economy had a large concentration of creative workers, or this high creative intensity, they call it, and those sectors became the creative industries. So the creative industries are the industry sectors where over 30% of the people employed in those industries work in a creative occupation. So... This is the list of subsectors, and they've been, uh, been grouped into sort of major categories. So we have advertising and marketing, architecture, crafts, design and design of fashion, film, TV and radio, IT software and computer services, museums, galleries and libraries, music, performing and visual arts, and publishing. So that's sort of the breadth of the creative industries under this definition. Um, so you can see that there are different levels of creative intensity. For example, um, so the performing arts has 91% 90, of creative intensity. So most people who are working in that sector are highly, highly creative. Others are uh, far less. And it also includes things like publishing of computer games, other software publishing and computer programming activities. So there's quite a lot of digital within this definition. 
So I don't know what you all do, but I'm assuming that this definition would probably classify most of the work that goes on, certainly in the fuse box and probably within Wired Sussex as well. So that's the creative industries. Why are the creative industries important? I feel like I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but in the UK, around 2 million or 1 in 16 people are employed in the creative industries. Not only that, but employment is growing at a really, really fast rate. And you can see between 2011 and 2017, the employment in the creative industries grew by over 25%. And that's almost three times higher than employment in, um, in the UK overall. So it's one of the fastest growing sectors in terms of employment. It's also one of the fastest growing sectors in terms of money. So the creative industries in 2017 contributed 101.5 billion pounds to the UK economy. So that's 5.5% of the GVA of the whole UK economy was made by the creative industries. So it's a really, really important sector. And again, we see huge amounts of growth in this sector. So between 2010 and 2017, um, we see 58% growth. Again, sort of almost twice that of the UK growth overall. And you can see that the, the um, if that growth isn't evenly distributed across all the different areas within the creative industries. So advertising and marketing over doubled their GBA. Whereas things like publishing, they ha publishing has grown, but not as much. But you can still see that overall, super fast growth. So why, why are they growing so fast? What's going on? Well, there are lots of different reasons why the creative industries are taking off. One of the reasons that I think is key, and what I'm going to be talking about today, is this idea of fusion. So what do I mean by fusion? Fusion is the combination of arts and STEM knowledges. So STEM being science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And some people, when they talk about Fusion talk about the combination of science and creative skills. And I, that's one way of viewing fusion. I like to think of it in terms of arts and STEM because I think that science and technology can be very, very creative itself. I think it's sort of a false dichotomy to say that the arts are creative and that science isn't. You know, I think they both are. So, so I choose to look at it as the arts and STEM skills. And fusion can be within an individual. So, for example, my background is in theatre, and I'm now doing a PhD in science and technology studies, so I would consider myself to be a fused individual. Fusion can be between individuals or groups within an organisation. So if you're a TV production company, you might have writers, and then you might have a, um, sort of editing technicians. And they're both working together. They have different knowledges, different skill sets, but they're working together to produce one thing, which is a TV program. And then the third level is that fusion can be between different organisations within a project, so within a collaborative R&D project, for example, new product development, within a joint venture, possibly, maybe some kind of um, outsourcing arrangements could be considered fusion. So the idea is that it's about bringing together these different skills or these different knowledge bases that can happen at, at different levels. So, so why do I think that fusion is at the heart of creative industries growth? Some of you will know about the Brighton Fuse Report. Hands up if you know if you've heard of the Brighton Fuse Report. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, some people from the Fuse Box are quite familiar with it because it was uh, conducted um, by colleagues of mine at Sprue and with Wired Sussex. And what the Brighton Fuse Report looked at was it looked at the Brighton Creative and Digital Cluster to find out what was going on and why it was taking off and working so well. 
So what they did is they looked at this idea of fusion and they asked firms in the cluster to identify how often they used these different knowledges, sort of arts-based knowledges and technology. And what they found was that fused firms, so firms who combined these knowledges, grew faster than unfused firms. And also that superfused firms, so firms that combine these knowledges even more, grew even faster. So that's a really significant finding, that bringing these knowledge bases together really does seem to promote growth. Why might it promote growth? Well, they also found that fused firms were more innovative than unfused firms, and superfused firms were even more innovative. So, they measured innovation um, in a range of ways. So they asked people how often they um, develop new goods or new services, new software, new processes, um, how often they, um, so how, how empowered their staff were to try new things, all these different metrics. And you can see that in pretty much all of them, superfused firms did more, fused firms slightly less and unfused firms did a lot less. The only slight exceptions to those are patenting, which is sort of understandable because it's quite a niche area. Only certain types of firms or industries, you know, patenting is really sort of an issue there. Um, and staff training. You can see that unfused firms actually needed to train their staff a lot more. And we can assume that that's because they don't have the skills in-house that the other firms did. So to sort of summarise where we are so far, so we know that the creative industries are one of the fastest growing sectors of the UK economy, both in terms of employment and in terms of GVA. They're really, really important. We also know that fused firms are super high growth and really highly innovative. So if we think that this idea of fusion can be what is promoting innovation and that this innovation might be what is leading creative industries firms to grow and the creative industries are a really, really important sector of the economy, then why aren't we seeing more fusion? Why aren't businesses promoting fusion? Why isn't the government promoting fusion? What's, what's going on? What are the challenges? So I'd like to share this quote with you. <clears throat> so this is um, from Eric Schnipp, who's a Google executive chairman, and he says, we need to bring art and science back together. Think back to the glory days of the Victorian era. It was a time when the same people wrote poetry and built bridges. Over the past century, the UK has stopped nurturing its polymaths. Both sides seem to denigrate each other. To use what I'm told as a local vernacular, you're either a lovey or a boffin. So just out of interest, who here would consider themselves a lovey? Couple. And who here would consider themselves a boffin? <laughs> <laughs> I'd probably consider myself both. Right? But according to this, they're separate. So the thing that I find really interesting about this quote is firstly this idea that the UK has stopped nurturing its polymath that we don't have people who are trained in more than one discipline. The second part of this quote I find interesting is this idea of being a lovey or a boffin. That you have these two groups of people that are quite separate, normally sort of tribal. So I want to look at those, those two sets of issues in slightly more detail because I think they feed into each other. So why is there a lack of fused individuals? So... Since, since the Industrial Revolution, there's been a pursuit of specialisation. So the way that the economy functions is, that, uh, is through specialisation. The economy has become more and more specialised. And because the economy has become more and more specialised, the skills that people require have become more and more specialised. And we have a specialisation of educational pathways. So, for example, in, in the US, in higher education, they have majors and minors. 
and sort of first and second year undergraduates will be able to choose a variety of different modules from um, different subjects and then they sort of specialise slightly later on. In the UK, in higher education, we have one subject and it's really, really specialised. And even before then, at, at A-level, we choose maybe two or three A-levels or possibly one NVQ or one BTEC and they're highly, highly specialised. Considering that those educational pathways are so highly specialised, there's been this push towards people um, being on the STEM track, essentially. So, until recently, and it's only very recently, the arts were seen as non-economically viable, right? They were kind of an extra. They were something that's nice to have around, but not really something that's going to make us any money or keep the economy going. Um, and so all of this creative industries policy has only really been around since sort of 1997, 1998. It's relatively new. And because of that, there has been for quite some years a real push on STEM skills and a lack of push on art skills. And actually what's interesting is that the... Um, in the industrial strategy that was out last year, they have a, they're really, really pushing the creative industries, right? Because they've seen these, policymakers have seen these statistics as well, and they can see that the creative industries are growing and they want to help promote them. But their skills policy, their, their answer to this is, well, we need more STEM. We need more STEM-trained people to promote the, the creative industries, not we need more artists, right? Because we we'll always have artists, that, that's not an issue. So this is why I think that there has been um, a lack of polymaths or a lack of people who have uh, multiple training. So considering the fact that we have highly specialised workforce, the question then becomes how do we manage that specialised workforce? If we have people who are highly trained in the arts or highly trained in STEM skills, how do we bring them together? So there's an area of literature that looks at diversity in teams um, or in projects. And most of it looks at what's called observable diversity, which is things like gender and age. But some of it looks at skills diversity. And what this academic literature says, there's been lots of studies that show that diverse teams have a really positive impact on innovation because it brings together people with different perspectives, different attitudes, different ways of working, and that really promotes and encourages innovation there's almost an equal amount of research that says skills diversity is terrible for innovation because if you bring people together with different skill sets, they don't know how to communicate, they argue, they feel territorial over their knowledge domains. So the general consensus in this area of literature seems to be that, that skills diversity is beneficial for innovation but only when it's managed correctly. So the question then becomes, well, how do we manage this diversity? How do we manage fusion? So a second area of literature is called the knowledge integration literature. And that looks at how to integrate the knowledge held by individuals into something. Right? So it's not just the shared knowledge of individuals, it's the combined knowledge that emerges from their interaction. So it's actively combining knowledge to create something new. And that literature says that <clears throat> things that affect uh, knowledge integration, the way that we can manage this fusion, involve things like organisational culture, organisational structure, team identification, how much people feel part of a team, how much trust there is within a team, the types of routines that there are within the firm, within the project, different rules and procedures, um, the interests and motivations of people working in those teams, the project goals or the organisational goals, um, task frequency and heterogeneity, so how often people work together, um, how often they work together on different types of, of job, different types of task. So all of these different things apparently contribute to how well um, or how badly knowledge is integrated, how well we, we can manage this idea of fusion. And that's fine, but that 
that's not particularly helpful to you guys. So you need to say, well, how do we manage fusion? Oh, you need to address all of these things. It's not a particularly succinct or helpful answer. It might be true, they might all play a role, but it's not, not necessarily the most helpful thing for you. So I want to think about what, what's the heart at the heart of, of all of these things? What's the, the real crux of this issue of fusion, of how people working together with different skills and knowledges um, can promote innovation, but can also be tricky, and how do we manage that? And the thing that I think is at the crux of this is the idea of common knowledge. So common knowledge comprises those elements of knowledge which are common to all organisational members, the intersection of their individual knowledge sets. So I might know something very different to you, but we both speak English. So that's an intersection. Mm -hmm. Common knowledge can mean a common language, a common understanding. So if you use a three-letter acronym, I know what that means. Common identity, we feel that we're the same type of person. Common goals, we want the same things. Common motivations, we have the same or similar reasons for wanting those things. Or a common culture. And by culture, I, I don't mean sort of religion or from the same place necessarily. I mean more a common way of working, a common way of doing things. And most of the literature on common knowledge kind of focuses on this idea that we know that diversity is good, right? We like diversity. But that in order to communicate, people need to have a certain level of common knowledge so that they can get on. And a lot of the literature views it as, um, as a sort of continuum and, and that you need to find the optimum level, that there's a sort of optimal balancing point between diverse knowledge and common knowledge. And I think that's really interesting. But what my research is looking at specifically is whether there is such a thing as an optimal balancing point, and when, whether maybe actually some types of common knowledge are necessary for communication, but some types actually you don't need. And in fact, maybe if we do have a different way of understanding something, that in itself can promote innovation. That where there are these misalignments or mismatches between what we know and how we think, that that is the creative force behind innovation. So essentially I'm examining whether I'm looking at each of these different types of common knowledge and the context that they are used and how they affect innovation, how they work with innovation. Spot on. So to summarise before we move on to the discussion, fusion is a driver of innovation and growth in the creative industries. Quite difficult to acquire a few skill set, I think, at the individual level. And fusion is quite difficult to manage at a, a firm project or, or inter firm level. But I think that by better understanding the relationship between common and diverse knowledge, we can manage fusion better and we can help to, to promote innovation. So that's all I'm going to talk about today. Um, thank you very much for listening.